السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. I'll just request the light in the holes to be uh, turned on and uh, spotlight to be a little bit lower. I want to see the people. Once again, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم My brothers and sisters in Islam let me have your attention please All of you stand up بسم الله الرحمن Kindly show me your hands. Show me your hands. Show me your hands. Everyone, raise up your hands up high. All right, everybody smile. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. MashaAllah, tabarakallah, all of you. All right, you can sit down now, MashaAllah. Just, I'm missing you so much, MashaAllah. <laughs> All right, let's uh, begin. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. My brothers and sisters in Islam, I'd like to begin by congratulating Connect Institute for arranging this conference. And when I refer to Connect Institute, I'm referring to the team behind the preparation, including Islam in Focus and everyone who was involved uh, in, in, in putting together this beautiful conference, MashaAllah, Tabarakallah. And uh, those who know that uh, uh, I am s somehow associated with Connect Institute, I actually had no idea, I had no idea that the, the team has come together and put all this preparation. I was just saying, how are you doing guys? Are you okay? Is everything in order? And they would say, don't worry big brother, just come to the Philippines. And mashallah, tabarakallah, they have surprised me and impressed me. May Allah accept our efforts. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept your efforts by sacrificing your weekend and being with us here inshallah in the company of the angels because the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us that whenever there is a gathering where the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is being mentioned, the angel comes and seek forgiveness for each and every one of, of us. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept your efforts. My brothers and sisters in Islam, I want you to imagine with me one thing. Imagine if you have a son or a daughter who have chosen to be disbelievers, who have chosen to take the path of unbelief. Not only that, but they have died upon that condition. I want you to imagine that situation. I want you to imagine with me your own parents, father or your mother, who chose to be disbelievers. They have actually chose to be on that path of unbelief, rejecting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all together, rejecting the message of Islam. I want you to imagine this for a second. Not only that, but they have died upon that condition. I want you to imagine with me, my brothers and sisters in Islam, your beloved relatives, uncles and aunties. I want you to imagine with me, some of them have chosen to be disbelievers. They have rejected the message of Islam. They have rejected the message of the prophets. I want you to imagine them with me. Those people have chosen this belief and died upon that condition. What will you feel? What will be your feelings like? Your emotions? And I want you to remember that this exact scenario had taken place in the past. I want you to remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had tested his prophets with these very difficult trials. Their own loved ones, their family members, some of them have rejected Allah, have rejected the message of Islam, have rejected them as prophets, and they died upon that condition. 
And they were human beings, yes, chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But at the end of the day, they were human beings. They have got feelings. I want you to remember. I want you to imagine with me their feelings. I want you to imagine the feeling of Nuh alayhi salam as we have enjoyed listening to the lecture of Dr. Muhammad Salah and how his son, his own son, had rejected him as a prophet, had rejected the message of Islam and died upon that condition. What was the feeling of Prophet Nuh like? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What was his feeling like? I want you to imagine Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam calling his father again and again to submission, calling his father to stay away from worshipping idols and stones and turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yet he chose this belief and he died upon that condition. How was the feeling of Prophet Ibrahim like? How was the feeling of Prophet Nuh and Lut when they saw their own spouses going against the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and dying upon that condition? How was the feelings like? How was the feeling of our beloved Muhammad, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who was begging his uncle to take the shahada just before his demise? Yet he chose the path of disbelief and he refused the invitation of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his dear uncle, the one who supported him even though he did not accept Islam. Yet, my brothers and sisters in Islam, Allah had chosen you to be Muslims. Allah had chosen you to be Muslims. Allah had decided for you to be born in a state of Islam. Maybe you were born in Marawi city or in, in Mindanao where you found your family members are Muslims. So you became Muslims. You have chosen Islam along the way and you started practicing Islam. Maybe you have attended a seminar like this in the past and as a result Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opened your heart and you have decided to become a Muslim. Allah had chose for the closest people to the Prophet's heart. Some of them Allah had chosen for them billah, hellfire. Yet Allah had picked you and gave you that opportunity. Gave you that opportunity to be upon the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which He had chosen for you. الْيَوْمَ أَكْمَلْتُ لَكُمْ دِينَكُمْ وَأَتْمَمْتُ عَلَيْكُمْ نِعْمَتِي وَرَضِيتُ لَكُمْ الْإِسْلَامَ دِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that this day I have perfected your religion for you, completed my favor upon you, and chosen for you Islam to be your way of life. أَكْمَلْتُ أَتْمَمْتُ رَضِيتُ Allahu Akbar. I have completed, I have perfected, I have chosen Islam for you to be your way of life. This is the greatest favor that Allah had bestowed upon us. Yet sometimes we take things for granted and we feel or we think that because I was born in that state or that city or that country or I was born from that tribe or that family, Jannah is guaranteed. I want you to just, just imagine that if you have practiced Islam perfectly throughout your life and you have obeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger all your life and you died upon that condition I want you to imagine that on the day of judgment Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is admitting you to Jannah is telling you welcome to my Jannah yet in hellfire there are some people who were during the lifetime the family members of the chosen ones, the prophets of Allah. What a blessing my brothers and sisters that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had chosen this deen for us. So don't lose it. Don't lose it. Why am I making this introduction? Because while Shaykh Mu'izz Bukhari was talking his lecture, I was listening. And he mentioned something that struck me. He said, let this conference be the beginning for you to change and to go out these doors deciding that from now on, 
I'm going to take my faith seriously. Then I remembered how many conferences we have attended in the past. How many countries we have visited and, and attended these kind of seminars. And I was wondering and asking myself, having the people already started something, having the people already started you know, changing themselves. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us among the people who listen to the reminders and the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and follow them to the best of our ability because what we are about to discuss is not a story. I'm not going to narrate the story of Ibrahim alayhi salam. We have already heard it again and again. But what we are about to discuss is the characteristics of a man who dedicated his entire life for one thing, the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. His level of submission was unmatched. And let us ask ourselves, where are we from this great man of God, Ibrahim alayhi salam? The man whose name is always associated with our five daily salah. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad. كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم In every salah, we are reminded of the Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam. He is immediately connected to our deen, Islam. What should we learn from this? But before we dwell further into the talk, I wanted you to remember something very important. I was talking to a brother and he told me, you know what? For me, Islam is the five pillars. You guys are complicating things. You are, you know, requesting from us a lot of things beyond our capacity. He's in a way, he's correct. He, in a way, he's correct. Sometimes people don't have the energy to do extra work. And there is a narration where a man came to the Prophet ﷺ Asking him that supposedly I just prayed five times a day, I fast the month of Ramadan, I paid my charity, I perform Hajj and so on. Will I be in Jannah? The Prophet ﷺ affirmed that this man will be in Jannah, inshaAllah. But there is another narration which I always reflect upon. And I ask a lot of my, of my teachers about, you know, some gems to deduce from this beautiful narration and I believe that many of us knows this narration by heart and that is Bunya al-Islamu anyone remembers? anyone speak Arabic? Bunya al-Islamu ala khams Islam has been established upon five pillars or Islam has been built upon five pillars now I want you to, to see my hands I want you to look at my hands Okay, and I will repeat the same phrase for a couple of times just to test your focus. Islam has been established upon five pillars. One more time. Islam, this is Islam, has been established upon, one more time for the brothers. This is not a magic trick, by the way. Don't worry. <laughs> Islam. Has, oh, Dr. Muhammad Salah is in the audience. <laughs> MashaAllah, Jazakallah khairan Habib. I feel scared when I talk in front of him. May Allah yani, forgive us all. <laughs> Islam has been established upon? So there is one thing here. The Prophet وسلم, in a way, he's making a distinction between Islam and its pillars. Otherwise, what is the significance of saying Islam has been built upon five pillars so there is something more that we need to look for within the house of islam if i came to manila i intended to buy a house and a brother suggested that there is a beautiful land you know next door for sale and i went to look at, for the land and i saw mashallah the land is spacious beautiful and there are you know pillars all over the place okay i agreed i will pay for it and I purchased the land. Can I bring my wife and my children and move in tomorrow in that land and live there? Yes. <laughs> will you live within the land? Will you live within the pillars? Will you sleep there? You will be exposed to a lot of things, right? You will be exposed to heat, especially in Manila. <laughs> 
you will be exposed to jibneys. You will expose to those people who pass by and do things in the streets. You know what I mean? Nobody will care about you. You will be exposed to maybe uh, wild dogs, uh, typhoon. You will not be protected. There will be no shelter, no walls, no ceiling, no furniture, nothing. How could you move in? But the pillars are so strong. So I could build upon that. Similarly, my brothers and sisters in Islam, the pillars of Islam are the foundations of this deen. The stronger your pillars are, the stronger the house is, right? So tell me about your, your pillar of salah. How is your pillar of salah? How is it? Is it strong enough? How's your fajr? Which unfortunately many people have neglected it. How's that pillar? Is it strong? Go further. How's the pillar of charity? Do you pay your obligatory zakah properly according to the you know, teaching of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger or you became so negligent and you don't even care and you just say, MashaAllah, I, I pay a lot. Don't worry, don't worry. It's not about not worrying. He said, no, 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 I'm very generous. I give a lot. It's not about that. First pay what is compulsory, what is necessary, what is required from you, then go for more. Don't worry. But how is that pillar? Is it strong? How is the fasting pillar, Ramadan? Does it impact you positively? Does it make you a better Muslim after spending 30 days fasting for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What happened after that? How is your Quran? Are you reading the Quran daily? Or are you visiting it from one Ramadan to another? How's your level of taqwa? Because that is the purpose of Ramadan. Ya ayyuha alladheena amanu, kutiba alaykum usiyamu kama kutiba ala alladheena min qablikum la'allakum tattaqoon. Oh, you who believe, raise up your hand. Oh, you who believe. Where are the believers? La hawla wa laqatillu. They are here, brother, don't worry. <laughs> we know them. Fasting was prescribed upon you as it was prescribed for the people before you. Why? So that you may attain God consciousness. So that you may attain self-restraint, self-control. To prevent yourself from going against the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His prohibitions. That's taqwa. To create a barrier between yourself and whatever angers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Does Ramadan give you that, you know, feelings? And so on and so forth. Once your pillars are strong enough, build upon that. How is your truthfulness, your level of honesty? How is your, your level of dealing with, with your neighbors, whether they are Muslims or not? We have in this country examples of people who don't want to deal with non-Muslims at all just because they have chosen a different religion. So we need to understand that the Prophet ﷺ used to communicate with non-Muslims. He used to invite them to Islam. He used to show them kindness and mercy. And as a result, because of his behavior, they ultimately came to Islam. And I always mention this beautiful story of the man who walked into the masjid and he urinated in the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ. I want you to picture that scene. If somebody walked in one of the masjids in the Philippines, let us say Kiapo Masjid. So I'm not trying to pick on Kiapo. I've been there many times, but just an example. And he urinated in the masjid. What will happen to this man? Yalla, let me, let me pick one of the brothers. Tell me just, you know, you've, you've been living here for a while. <laughs> Dead, no? Inna lillahi wa inna. There's one brother. <laughs> this one brother told me, we will make him minced beef, brother. Minced beef. <gasps> Dead. He will be beaten up. La hawla wa la illa. May Allah save us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the right understanding. So can you imagine we kill the brother in the afternoon janazah? Allahu Akbar, Allahumma ghfil lahu So why don't you kill him? Leave him 
Invite him to Islam and then, you know, he, he might be, he may think and come to Islam and understand. Anyway, this happened in the presence of the, of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he told, the comp and the companions had this reaction of going to prevent him. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the mercy to the entire creation, told the companions, leave him to finish. Subhanallah, to relieve himself. Leave him. And later on, he talked to the man in private. And according to some narrations that I've heard, that the man became a Muslim just because how the Prophet ﷺ dealt with him. My brothers and sisters in Islam. Today, I wanted to talk about the Prophet Ibrahim ﷺ and six rules. I call them six rules that governed the character of Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam. Six rules. And we're gonna make notes insha'Allah so that when we go home, we paint these notes properly in your other notebooks, color them, make some symbols so that you can, you know, come back again and again and, 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 and visit these notes so that you can be always reminded insha'Allah ta'ala. Six rules. But before that, Ibrahim alayhi salam had a very special place in the, in, the, in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one of the ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describing Ibrahim alayhi salam, saying, Inna Ibrahim kana ummatan. Inna Ibrahim kana ummatan. Ibrahim was an exemplar, an ummah. He was a man equal to a nation. His level of, of faith and submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was unmatched. Why, my brothers and sisters in Islam? I, I would be asking this why a lot. I want you to reflect. We need to ponder. We're not here just to watch some people who come on YouTube, uh, you know, talking, you know, and teaching Islam, and that's it, and taking some selfies and go home, do nothing. Please, let us stop that culture. Let us come here with one intention only. And that is, there is a distribution of the legacy of the, of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu that we needed to be reminded of. And insha'Allah, as a result, we will practice that to the best of our ability. Ameen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described that Ibrahim alayhi salam was very grateful to the favors that Allah had bestowed upon him. Shakiran li an'umihi jtabahu wa hadahu ila suratin mustaqeem. Because of that gratefulness of Ibrahim alayhi salam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose him, he picked him, and he guided him to a straight path. What we can deduce from this lesson or from this ayah is that if you show gratefulness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what will happen? Allah will guide you to the straight path. That's why every single day of our life, every single day, when we pray, we read Al-Fatiha and we ask Allah repeatedly throughout the day, in every rakah, to an extent that if you didn't read Al-Fatiha in any of your salah, your salah will be invalid. No salah without Al-Fatiha. And in Al-Fatiha we say what? إِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us to the straight path. In Fajr. In Dhuhr, what do we say? إِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ In Asr, the same. In Maghrib, إِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ In Isha, إِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ Ya Allah, aren't we guided already? Haven't we recited the Shahada? Aren't we Muslims already and we are granted Jannah? My brothers and sisters in Islam, Jannah is not that cheap. Jannah requires some efforts. The Prophet ﷺ mentioned that this is the commodity of Allah and the commodity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so precious. Allah in silat Allahi ghaliyah. The product, the product of Allah or the commodity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so precious. And that is Jannah. That is the product of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So don't sit back and relax and say, I'm Fatima, I'm Aisha, I'm Muhammad, I'm Mustafa, I'm going Jannah anyway. Yes, we should have hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
We should always hope that we will be next to the Prophet sallallahu insha'Allah in al-Firdaus al-A'la. I'm not saying don't hope for that. But also you need to accompany that hope with some efforts. Look at the, look at the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The prophet of Allah is still praying. Is still asking forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our beloved prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, whose sins, past and future, were forgiven. Yet, the companions, may Allah be pleased with him, used to count 100 times istighfar. 100 times the Prophet ﷺ used to say astaghfirullah. I seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How about you and I? If our beloved Prophet ﷺ used to seek istighfar 100 times, how about me and you, my brothers and sisters in Islam? So I'm not saying lose hope. No, hope for Jannah. I always tell my brothers and sisters, dream Jannah. Talk to your children all the time about Jannah. We were talking about Harry Potter a little bit. I, I laughed a lot because the more you read all these imaginary stories, what happened in your brain is chemical reactions actually take place when any unbelievable story, you know, I call it La La Land, a land that never exists, things that never exist. And unfortunately, I came here last year and I want to do that exercise today. Inshallah, just to see how many of you are still watching movies? Raise up your hand. Don't be shy. Dr. Salah is not watching. <laughs> okay. All right. Put down your hands. How many of you have seen any single movie where two people were falling in love with one another? Raise up your hand. Be truthful. Raise up your hand. Let me see hands. Okay. How many of you have seen the same movie where a man, the man proposed to the family of the girl. They, he wanted to marry her. Raise up your hand. Great. How many of you have seen the same movie where the father of the girl have rejected the proposal because the man is poor? How many of you have seen that scene? Many of us. How many of you have seen the same movie where the girl had decided to run away from her home, from her parents, who brought her up, who spent on her all her life, who were there next to her bedside when she was sick. Now because she met someone who she barely knew few weeks back, few months back, few years back, now she wants to leave her mother. She wants to leave her father, her elderly parents. She wanted to leave them for the sake of someone whom she loved. How many of you have seen that movie? Raise up your hand. My brothers and sisters in Islam, in every culture there is a movie of that sort. No matter what movie you're watching, Indian movies, American movies, Egyptian movies, obviously. <laughs> so one day I was watching with my grandma in the past. <laughs> I was watching that, that movie where the girl decided to leave home and her boyfriend was waiting for her outside with flowers. And of course, the sisters, when they look at these things, they say, how I wish my future husband would be that romantic, you know. <laughs> right? So, what happened? The girl left, but before leaving, she wanted to steal her, her father's car key. Yeah. So she went in the room, she opened the door, and of course the director, he must create that suspense. You know, like, <laughs> yeah? <laughs> and so the father, the father, as if he was disturbed of the sound, so he started turning his side left and right, and all of a sudden, from nowhere, my grandma made a dua. Ya Allah, please don't let the father wake up, please. <laughs> That's what they wanted to teach us. That's what they want to teach you, sisters especially. This is what they, what they want to tell you. That when you find someone you fall in love with, no matter what his background, no matter what his background is, his religion, his manners, it doesn't matter. So long as he's saying, I love you, it's okay, go for it. And as a result, my grandma was making a dua for the haram to happen. 
And this is, this is the impact of movies and, and imaginary stories upon our brain. And what happened is, that's why they knew the psychology of human beings, so they introduced these TV series, sitcom. Yeah? And the Filipinos, mashaAllah, as if there is no enough Filipino TV series, so they imported from Korea. They have finished all the stories in the world, so now they can't go, you know, they can't produce more, so they bring from Korea, please, Japan, okay, no problem. We don't understand the language, it's fine, don't worry. So long as there is a boy and a girl hugging each other, it's fine, bring it in. And this TV series comes every single day on a particular time. They study the psychology of habit, how habit is being formed. It's an action that you perform regularly, continuously, until you train your brain that this action has become necessary for your survival. And then it turns into an autopilot action that sometimes we do the action without even knowing that we are doing it. That's why these cell phones, sometimes you see people like zombie. They walk in the street just scrolling down. They don't know what they're doing. They are actually not reading. And then I read a paper just recently that they discovered, they made a study that actually 90% of the time when we are spending time on cell phones and, and, and things like that, 90% of the time we are not doing anything useful, only 10% of the time. The remaining is scrolling down. <laughs> scrolling your life away. Until you reach to the post that you, ah, I've seen that before. Okay, let us refresh. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. So what, one of the things that we need to learn from the story of Ibrahim is seriousness. You have to be serious, my brothers and sisters. And I'm not saying that we can't have fun. Aren't we having fun now? Aren't we learning? And at the same time, we are cracking a joke here and there. We're still, we're still learning. But what I mean is, there is no compromisation when it comes to the deen. Your salah, there is no, no, no joke about it. No excuse about it. Your, your respect for your sisters, there is no question about it. Your respect for your husband, for your wife, there is no question about it. This is something engraved in our deen. No compromisation should... You know, I'll tell you something about seriousness. How, just to give you a, a picture, to draw a mental picture on you. When I was young, I wanted to... <laughs> this would be sound funny. And unfortunately, uh, we are broadcasting live, so <laughs> the entire world. But anyway, when I was young, I wanted to play Kung Fu. Now, Mufti Mink, the other day, in, uh, I think in Zamboanga last year, he called me Teddy Bear. So, so what, <laughs> yesterday he said, no, but you lost weight, so you're not teddy bear anymore. Alhamdulillah. But now, because I mentioned the Kung Fu Panda, maybe you, uh, Kung Fu Panda. <laughs> maybe because I, I mentioned that example of the Kung Fu, you will call me Kung Fu Panda. But anyway, I wanted to play Kung Fu. I really wanted, I like that style of martial arts and so on. And I used to watch all Bruce Lee movies. And when Jackie Chan came in, ah, oh, Jackie Chan. So I, I love these things. So one day I decided I want to play Kung Fu. This is my vision. But how? We were simple, you know, my family was simple, so we cannot really enroll in clubs and go and train every day. So I was wondering, maybe from the movies I'll learn. So I'll watch movie. I'll watch one of the Bruce Lee movies. And then I will go and find my brother. And then I start beating him up. Ah, ah. Yes, I'll watch and I'll try to imitate. Thinking that by doing this, I will be learning Kung Fu and improving my health and muscles will be popping up by itself, you know? So one day I was walking down the street and I saw that newsstand, newspaper stand. So I look and I saw a book with Bruce Lee's photos doing like this. And the caption, the title of the book was what? Learn Kung Fu in 30 days. I say, that's it. That's it. I bought the book. I went home and I opened the first page. Day one. 
Hmm. I say, okay. Hmm. Anything else? No. Day one, just do this. Day two, hmm. And I finished the 30 days doing like this, doing like that, and I didn't learn anything. In fact, I gained weight. <laughs> if you want to learn Kung Fu, go and read the biography of Bruce Lee to see how many hours he has spent in training to attain that superb level of martial arts. Look at Muhammad Ali, you know, the legend boxer. May Allah have mercy on him. Look at how he used to talk about training. He used to say in push-ups, he said, I don't count push-ups until I feel pain. Once I feel pain, I start counting. Because this is where it counts. As they say, no pain, no what? So if you want to be a true Muslim, if you want to be a real Muslim, you have to be serious about your faith. You have to put aside everything when the time for Salah is announced. And here are the six rules that I think uh, uh, are the ones that govern the, char the character of Prophet Ibrahim السلام, because characters define who you are. Manners, your, your, your way of dealing with your mother, tell me whether you're a good husband or not. If you're treating your mother with all respect, I will hand you my daughter in marriage. But if you are disobeying your mother continuously, if you are screaming at her, shouting at her, then how will I trust you with my daughter? Right? And one more thing that I have to bring up since we are in the Philippines, and that is forced marriages. Something that has become really widely spread. Everywhere we go in the Philippines, people, sisters are approaching us and complaining about how their parents sometimes push them to get married against their own will. And my brothers and sisters, if you're parents, raise up your hand. Raise up your hand if you are a parent. None of you is a parent? <laughs> Everybody now? No. <laughs> this is for you, my brothers and sisters. If your daughter came to you, telling you that there is a person whom I desire to marry. Give her all the advice that you have. Talk to her about what the Prophet ﷺ teaches us when it comes to relationship between the genders. Teach her all you want. Advise her all you want. But never force her against their, her will because this is haram in Islam. This is prohibited in Islam. To give your daughter in marriage against her will, this is unacceptable. And the Prophet ﷺ was approached by a lady who was actually married by her father against her will. And she was complaining to the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, he told her, if you wish, you could invalidate the marriage. Putting all the balls in her court now, telling her it's up to you. So don't make this mistake. Don't let the Prophet Sallallahu you know, disagree with you on the Day of Judgment. Always remember, whenever you are facing any situation in life, and this is something that I have been blessed to find out from my teachers, ask yourself the following question. Whenever you're confused about what to do, there is two things to do. And you're not unsure whether this is halal or haram. Ask yourself the following question. If the Prophet ﷺ was here with us today, will he agree with you or not? If the Prophet ﷺ visited your home while you are lying down on a couch watching TV series or MTV songs, video clips and whatnot, will he come and sit next to you and watch with you? Ask yourself this question and if the, if the answer is no, shut down the TV and do something else that he would approve of on the Day of Judgment. If the Prophet ﷺ, men or women who started smoking, saying that smoking is not haram, it's only makru. It's not, it's not. As if, yani, if, if cigarette and shisha or whatever you call it, if it is not haram, if it is makru, will you do something that Allah hates? How dare you to do something that Allah dislikes? 
Remember this. If the Prophet ﷺ is next to you, will you talk to him while you are blowing the smoke in his face? No, you wouldn't. Therefore, it's haram. Throw it. Enough with the addiction. Enough with the, my brothers and sisters in Islam. I have been studying the science of addiction to internet, gaming, pornography, and it is epidemic. I cannot believe it. And this is the thing, I believe that this is the thing that, preventing, that is preventing us from reaching that potential of becoming people who deserve to be next to the prophets of Allah on the day of judgment. That's why Allah gives us these ayat, these signs to reflect and to ponder and to imitate these great men of God so that we can be with them in Jannah. If you want to be with them in Jannah, be like them in dunya. That's the criteria. You want to be next to them in Jannah, act like them in dunya and you will get there. Love them so much and you cannot love anyone without knowing him. You have to know them. You have to study their seerah and do your best to study, to, to practice what they did. You will be like them insha'Allah ta'ala. What are these rules, my brothers and sisters in Islam? Rule number one, the rule of non-dependency. And I will explain everything. But these, these bullet points, I want you to write it down so that it can remind you of what we have discussed. The rule of non-dependency, meaning that just, not because I have been selected by Allah to be, to, to be a prophet, I will rely on that and do nothing. I will not bring a throne and sit on and order everyone to do the job on my behalf. No, 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 no. Look at Ibrahim alayhi salam making dua to Allah as recorded in the Quran. Rabbi ja'alni muqeem as-salati Rabbi ja'alni muqeem as-salati wa min dhurriyati rabbana wa taqabbal dua. O Allah, made me of the people who will establish the salah, not only that, and my descendants, my children. Look at who is making the dua. This is the Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is praying already. And his two children, Ishaq and Ismail alayhim as -salam, both of them are prophets and messengers. So how could they not pray? They must be the first to pray. Yet, he did not rely on that. He did not depend on that. He is still making dua to Allah to protect him from not praying. Allahu Akbar. He and his children. In another ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned Ibrahim alayhi salam. وَإِذْ قَالَ إِبْرَاهِيمُ رَبِّ جَعَلْ هَذَا الْبَلَدَ آمِنًا وَجْنُبْنِي وَبَنِيَّ أَنْ نَعْبُدَ الْأَصْنَامِ Oh Allah, when Ibrahim alayhi salam called up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Oh Allah, made this city a place of security and prevent me and my children from worshipping what? Idols. The man who broke the idols. I want you to imagine this. The man who broke the idols and go against his people, he's praying to Allah to prevent him from idols. Why? To show you that nothing is guaranteed. Nothing is guaranteed, my brothers and sisters. Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu arda said, if one of my foot is already in Jannah, I will never feel secured from the plan of Allah. Maybe Allah will change his plan. Who said that? Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu arda, the man who was given already a, a, a guarantee of Jannah during his lifetime, where the Prophet ﷺ told him, you are in Jannah. Yet he said, if one of my foot is in Jannah, I will never feel secure from the plan of Allah. So learn this. Do your best and never be proud about what you're doing. Never, never wake up in the, in the morning praying tahajjud or qiyamul layl or fajr and looking at your brothers and sisters, maybe in your family members are not praying like you and you feel so proud that you are better than them. Rather, say alhamdulillah. الذي هداني لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله All praise due to Allah who guided me to this and had I not been guided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala I would never, I would have never been guided Always relate your goodness to Allah Always give the credit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Never rely on your good deeds my brothers and sisters in Islam The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa himself He said that I will not enter Jannah with my deeds. 
Who are we to be proud about our deeds and go and belittle everyone else? So we have to be careful. The rule of non-dependency. Such great people who were picked by Allah, who were called, وَاتَّخَذَ اللَّهُ إِبْرَاهِيمَ خَلِيلًا Allah had picked Ibrahim, had taken him as a close friend. What an honor! What an honor given to Ibrahim السلام, and his family in the Quran. Yet, he did not rely on that. He was serious about the deen. Let us be serious a little bit. To be honest with you, we will never attain that level, right? We will never attain that level of Ibrahim. But at least do our best. Let us reach to our potential. Insha'Allah Ta'ala. Rule number two. Unshakable reliance on Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. We cannot imagine a person who would be told you're going to be thrown in fire by his people and he do nothing but Hasbunallah wa ni'mal wakil. Allah is sufficient for me and he's the disposer of all affairs. And he was what? How old was he? قَالُوا سَمِعْنَا فَتَنْ يَذْكُرُهُمْ يُقَالُ لَهُ إِبْرَاهِيمُ We heard a, a boy, a little boy, making mention of them. His name is Ibrahim. فَتَنْ A little boy. Yet he was not shaken, he was not threatened. According to some narration, they have actually placed, you know, they, they have invented this catapult. You know the catapult, they put him on one end and they release the other, and then it throw him to a height, to a long distance. According to some narration, they have built a furnace and they set it on fire and they throw him into the fire through that catapult. And he went into the hellfire and according to that narration, the angel Gabriel came to him and told him, do you want something from me? I'm ready for you. He said, as of you, I don't need anything. As from Allah, Hasbunallah wa ni'mal wakil. The lesson is, do what is right. Continue doing what is right. And if things go wrong according to your own perspective, rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and say, Hasbunallah wa ni'mal wakil. So long as you're doing what is right, put your trust in Allah. You will be tested, as we will see now. You will be tested. Rule number three, the rule of challenging his own tradition. And this is something very relatable to our brothers and sisters in the Philippines. Because sometimes culture influences your deen. The way how you were brought up on certain things can actually if affect on your deen negatively. You see, Ibrahim السلام, was born in a community who worship idols. So naturally, the natural reaction of a man who was born in that environment is what? Is to also follow his tradition. Yet, he was intelligent. And Allah had given us all, all of us, Allah had given us that intellect, that power, that God-given gift of thinking and reasoning. We need to reflect sometime and sit down together. And wallahi, my brother and sister, I was in a certain country and I asked a lady, I asked a lady, who is more important, your culture or the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ? And I was shocked, wallahi, I was shocked to hear from the full lips of this lady telling me what? My culture. And believe me, there are many people like that who follow their culture no matter what. No matter what. Even if you bring an evidence from the Quran, from the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, where are you from? Have you heard that? You know when you advise someone, if you are from a different country, they would, where are you from? I'm from Egypt. I don't know. We are from Philippines. We are Tausug. We are Maranao. We are what not. We are different. No, no, don't worry. We are Muslims still, but this thing, no, no. They pick and choose. Enter into Islam, all of you, Filipinos, Egyptians, and everyone else on planet, since you have decided to become a Muslim, Enter into Islam wholeheartedly. You can take with you all the cultures that match the religion and leave out these things that contradict the religion. That's fine. You see how Ibrahim alayhi salam talked to his, to his father. 
يا أبت إني قد جاءني من العلم ما لم يأتك فاتبعني فاتبعني أهدك صراطا سويا Oh my father, indeed, knowledge has come to me, not to you. He's challenging his father's knowledge now, respectfully. Listen to the words. Ya abati, oh my father, oh my daddy. A respectful term. Ya abati, beautiful term. Relaxing him from any anger. Oh my father, knowledge has come to me, so please listen. Just I want to share with you something that I've learned. Learn the arts of advising elderly. Learn the arts of advising your parents because sometimes their ego at that, at, at that old age, sometimes they don't want to accept that their children are their teachers. Don't let them feel that. Go humbly and tell them, listen, I've listened to this narration. What do you think? Do you think that this is... Let him teach you indirectly what you want to teach him. Respect. The rule number four, inshallah, because they have shown me the signs. Uh, I have only 10 minutes. Now they are less than 10 minutes. May Allah forgive Connect Institute. <laughs> rule number five. Okay, we will skip one rule, all right? You forgive me for that. Rule number five and rule number six are very important for us in this, in very relatable to us. The rule of sacrifice. The rule of sacrifice. And this is not an invitation to parents to go home and start slaughtering their children. All right? <laughs> the rule of sacrifice. Sacrificing something that may be preventing you from becoming a better Muslim. Sacrifice that. Leave it out. Like the young boy who was addicted to pornography and his problem was his cell phone. And when he discovered that this is what is holding him back, what is holding him back, he gave up his cell phone. I like it so much, I love it so much, but it's not making me better, a better Muslim, I leave it out. Look into your life, what is preventing you from becoming a better Muslim, leave that out. Whether he's a friend or someone is trying to invite you to bad things, leave it out. Sacrifice friends for the sake of Allah. We just heard from uh, uh, Dr. Muhammad Salah, the prophets have sacrificed their own family. They have disowned them for the sake of Allah. And you don't want to sacrifice few hundred sometimes to attend an Islamic event where the name of Allah is being mentioned. لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله. Ibrahim alayhi salam was willing to sacrifice his own son. Not his willing, he was doing it. فلما أسلم وتله للجبين. When they both, the father and his son, when Ibrahim and Ismail, both of them surrendered to the command of Allah, that means they were about to continue with the act. Only then. Can you see the test to what extent? And no one questioned the wisdom behind this. Neither the father nor the son or even Hajar. The wife, can you imagine? The, wife, the, the mother of Ismail is watching her husband dragging her, his son and about to kill him and she didn't say nothing because she knew it is the command of Allah. No joke about it. Learn to sacrifice something. We will not be given that test anymore. Sacrifice something in your life that will bring you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the more you sacrifice, the more you become dearer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You see, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the good news of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, to Mary, he sent the angels. He did not call Mary directly. He sent the angels. إِذْ قَالَتِ الْمَلَائِكَةِ When the angels calls to Mary, we are giving you good news of a child to be born, right? And when Zakaria alayhi salam called to Allah, Ya Allah, I need a child, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said what? He sent the angels. Ya, ya Zakaria, inna nubashiruka bi ghulamin ismuhu Yahya. Oh Zakaria, we give you good news of a child to be born whose name is John, Yahya. It is the angels. But when Ibrahim alayhi salam and Ismail surrenders completely the highest level of submission. I want to conclude. I know that I'm a bit 
over inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. I am the founder of this organization. لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله. They just saw they just saw Sheikh Wahash coming in. So when Ibrahim alayhi salam and Ismail surrendered completely to the commands of Allah, it was Allah Himself who called them. فَنَادَيْنَاهُ أَنْ يَا إِبْرَاهِيمُ We called him, O Ibrahim, you have already fulfilled, you know, the vision that you have seen. So the more you are sacrificing your desires, the things that are, you know, preventing you from reaching to that potential of becoming a better Muslim, leave it out, my brothers and sisters in Islam. Cut it out. Cut it out. And lastly is the rule of leaving a legacy. Leaving a legacy. When Yaqub was about to die, he gathered all his children to tell them what? مَا تَعْبُدُونَ مِنْ بَعْدِي What will you worship after me? Imagine, Yaqub a prophet of Allah who brought his children upon Tawheed, upon the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he is 100% sure that they know the right answer. Yet, before dying, before departing from this dunya, he asked them, what are you going to worship after me? My brothers and sisters, this is a lesson for every parent. To instill in the hearts and minds of your children the legacy of the prophets of Allah, the legacy of the prophet of Muhammad Sallallahu by fulfilling the vision of the prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When the prophet Sallallahu was standing, addressing the people for the last time, he told them, Convey on my behalf even a single verse. That's the vision. That's the legacy that we wanted to continue doing, inshallah. Because Allah is going to continue that vision with or without you. So be part of it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from all of us. Jazakumullahu khayran. I love you all for the sake of Allah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.